The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Today's webinar, the topic is Overcoming E-Discovery Bottlenecks. Uh, it is sponsored by Index Engines. We are proud to have two uh, esteemed speakers today uh, from E-Discovery Journal and TransPerfect Legal Solutions. Our speakers today are Babs Deacon, is one of our um, guest speakers. She is Director of Strategic Consulting with EDJ Group. Babs has over 25 years of discovery and information management experience, specializing in providing consulting, project management, and data reduction services to law firms, corporations, and government clients, including management of the 9-11 World Trade Center project for the Law Department of, of the City of New York. Babs is also pioneering influencer in eDiscovery best practice review, and has <clears throat> managed numerous projects related to e-discovery trial, early case assessments, evidence acquisition, process review data reduction, application assessment, and vendor selection. Also joining us is Mike Woodkey. He is the President of Forensic Technology and Advisory Services at TransPerfect Legal Solutions. Mike leads a global team of digital forensics and electronic discovery professionals calling on his extensive experience investigating computer fraud, performing forensic examinations, and developing cutting-edge techniques and procedures. Michael is a world-class consultant, trainer, and expert witness. His broad experience in planning and delivering e-discovery service contributes to his status as a leading advisor for law firms and corporations around the globe. And myself, Jim again, I am VP of Marketing here with Index Engines, your sponsor for today. So the agenda is going to be basically a conversation with these, uh, these thought leaders in the industry talking about some of the bottlenecks affecting e-discovery. Um, recent cases, I think Babs is going to take us through some, some case law, a little bit of highlights there about defensibility and some botched DSI collections, which uh, are always painful. Uh, talk about some of the evolution of e-discovery technology. I know TransPerfect is one of the innovators in, in the field and, and uses some of the, the best technology that exists in the market today. Um, Talk about how leading service providers are tackling the challenges, what law firms should be asking these service providers and the relationship there. Um, workflow is going to be a big theme today. Uh, workflow challenges and fixes. I know a lot of the, the folks on the call today have a lot of great experience here. And then at the end, we'll wrap it up with some best practices about overcoming these bottlenecks. Um, if you do have questions on the right, you'll see a chat area, the lower right portion of your screen. Um, you, can, you can type those in there, and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take those. Um, either during the session or if we do run out of time, uh, we can take them at the, um, you know, individually offline. Okay, I apologize, I see the slides weren't changing, they should be changing now. Okay, so the first question's uh, for Babs, we wanna get your perspective. I know you spend a lot of time talking to different folks in the industry, and as we were preparing for this session, we were talking about the top three bottlenecks that are affecting e-discovery as workflow, defensibility, and obviously time and money. Um, so Babs, could you talk a little bit about these different topics here? Sure. And, you know, from the point of view of a bottleneck, we're looking at um, processes, no matter whether it's happening in a law firm, at a service provider, or, you know, within a corporation. And they can kind of be boiled down into these three areas. Um, and they're uh, certainly, certainly overlapping. So when we look at workflow, we're talking about how, um, how data moves uh, within processes, you know, from identification through the entire um, e-discovery e process. We're talking about the, technolo the, the, the technology interaction. Uh, we're talking about communication interaction. And, um, we're talking about documentation that happens related to those things. And, and when we're looking at bottlenecks, and we're going to be talking about this in more detail, uh, my question is when I'm looking at an organization is how much of these processes are seamless and or automated. Now when we look at defensibility, as I said, there's a lot of overlap here. We're looking at workflow that is a documented, repeatable process. Do people conduct similar tasks in the same way most of the time? And do, are they able to document that, again, without, with, with as little a human interaction as possible? That might sound counterintuitive. 
but again, that's part of the repeatable process. The more you're showing that this is the way you your 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 best practice, and that's the way you handle it most of the time, the more defensible your process is. And of course, this kind of boils down to time and money. And it, those two are not interchangeable. As we know in litigation, there are times when you have a lot more, there, you can have a lot more money than time. And so um, we've all seen those things where you say, well, let's, let's throw, we have to throw money at the problem because we only have two minutes to respond to the SEC, for example. So the workflow and the defensibility issues kind of uh, percolate into time management issues and then, of course, cost issues. And so um, I, I just think these are the three areas to look at when thinking about discovery bottlenecks. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, clearly defensibility is, is, is at the forefront when you're dealing with your clients because having a process that is not defensible will get you a not a good reputation, but can really destroy a lot of businesses and, and can really cause a lot of challenges uh, for many cases. So Babs, if we continue the conversation here and further discuss defensibility, um, there have been a number of cases where e-discovery has, has uh, been at the forefront for a botched collection. You know, do you have some experience in um, you know those cases, and what can we learn from them, and how can we avoid? Uh, being uh, attached to those cases. Well, you know, I, I think, and when I was when I was researching this, I was looking for not just collection, but also any any place in the the whole discovery process that we're looking at. And unfortunately, there isn't enough good stuff because a lot of these things happen, and they don't they don't make it to you know the 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 glare of publicity but i think but very quickly some cases that we need to look at is first of all i like always like to cite peerless industries v crimson av because and the quote from the judges uh, from the bench slap was defendants cannot place the burden of compliance on an outside vendor and have no knowledge or claim or control over the process so I like to quote this because it is, it's a wake-up call to everyone that you're the litigant, you're, res you're ultimate, ultimately responsible. So whether the stuff is happening in-house, whether your law firm is handling it, whether it's an outside vendor, you have to stay involved in, in the quality control. Um, and I think that that was a collection uh, case. Then we have um, Green v. Blitz. USA. I'm going to go through these really quickly, by the way, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a collection that was, was self-collected. It was not professionally conducted, um, and the internal IT didn't didn't participate in that. Um, so, you know, one of the hurdles we have in workflow is getting you know the right kind of participants. Um, so, what was interesting? Uh, so, I think that that is something to look at. Um, and that, again, is the sign of an, a not a repeatable process. If you're doing self-collection, I don't think that's repeatable. Here's one that actually relates to searching. Um, and it's 3M v. Canbar. And the, there was some kind of manual search performed um, for um, finding responsive documents that, that was referred to in the documents as, as a, a, a manual search and there was some human error. Okay? So there's a lack there, and I, and I don't know how they did it, but there's a lack there of, again, a, a repeatable process and, and I would say also automation. You know, a manual search to me is not a properly workflowed automated process. And then I, ha you know, I have um, some cases that are about um, the form of production. And I think that this, that's, it's the same case, it's, it's 3M v. Canbar, where they had to reproduce documents in an electronic format. Um, and I think that that's a failure of communication. That's a failure of um, prior planning. And I think probably the folks on this call are pretty hip by now that form of production should be discussed as early as possible during that whole, the whole meet and confer um, process. Well, I'd like to also mention Access Data Corp, the mm -hmm. Alst Tech, 
I'd like to mention this because this involved a foreign defendant that did not um, produce appropriately. Um, so, and and the court said basically, uh, yeah, you know, you cannot use that as an excuse. You're going to have to. They had to reproduce. Um, and then one last one, again, this is relates to uh, conversations about um, pro, uh, the form of production, and that's Adams v. Alliance 1. A final case, or I'm sorry, two final cases, one JM Manufacturing v. McDermott. And this again relates to the point I was making with the first case, which was that litigants cannot just rely on outside vendors, and they can't necessarily just rely on outside counsel. People have to be um, uh, involved in what's going on. <clears throat> there have to be quality controls in, in place. This case is still you know, happening. One of the things when you read about this one, it gets a lot of press, it doesn't seem like they can actually figure out right now how this, the privileged items were released. So I would say that there is no defensible process. If you can't even figure out how you made the boo-boo, um, that is a lack of a def uh, defensible prof uh, process. And I, I think that that really covers it. Well, I, I think one of the interesting things that's happened over the past, you know, over the past decade at least, or even more <coughs> recently, is that the cases are becoming significantly more complex. And I, I think we're going to hear from Mike at TransPerfect in a little bit about some of the experiences they, that they've seen. but as the cases are, have become complex, um, keeping up with technology um, and looking at workflows and evaluating processes is really critical because your customers, um, you know, if they demand, you know, uh, an affordable process that's defensible, um, if you're using older technology, um, there's, there could be some issues in there. So I think we want to talk a little bit about technology and, and, and one question again for you, Babs, is, you know, as technology has evolved and the advancements have occurred, um, has it, how does that affect defensibility, um, but not only defensibility, but cost and workflow with, with uh, not only ESI collection, but as you mentioned, the entire process from identification down to review? Well, I, I, I feel really positively about this issue um, with the research that I'm doing. Um, I'm seeing more and more automation of workflow. Um, I'm seeing less uh, less manual interaction. I'm seeing um, more and more applications that cover uh, more of the discovery process. And what's great about that is you're you're you know moving stuff around less. You're moving from application A to application B less. Um, and you know it's faster. It's cheaper. Uh, I also am very excited about the more transparent communication where um, application developers are able to make more information available to the client via the web and other methods earlier in the process as possible. So there's, the, you know, we'll talk about this later, but there's just, it, it makes a lot easier to assure that the project is going correctly if you're getting more real-time reporting. So I'm very excited about that kind of thing. Yeah. So I mean, um, Mike, you know, you TransPerfect is a global service provider definitely involved in some very significant cases that have a lot of challenges. Um, can you give us your perspective, perspective on defensibility, workflow, and time management? How do you guys maintain an edge in this market? And, and what's your uh, view of what we've been talking about today? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things that TransPerfect did to uh, really uh, meet meet these types of challenges um, and create an edge in the marketplace is to establish my division. Um, it happened about three years ago. Um, TransPerfect didn't really have uh, collections capability, and they were relying on other vendors to do the collections and. If something fell out of scope, I think we'll talk about scope uh, a little bit later, but if something was outside of scope, um, they simply wouldn't handle it. So my division was created um, solely to, to bring a new aspect, to bring the front end of the uh, litigation process in uh, from an identification and preservation component. Also, we were brought in to look, you know, to research and uh, acquire new technology. 
look at different ways of doing things instead of the, the standard run-of-the-mill you know, processing and hosting type cases. Um, since, since coming in, we've been looking at a number of different uh, types of technology out there. You know, smartphones have obviously evolved. Uh, we now have cloud storage, which uh, seems to be a component of uh, most cases that we see. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of social media and um, monitoring of social media and eventual production of that as well. And there are issues in discovery, you know, revolving around uh, email archives like Enterprise Vault. Uh, really, from a workflow perspective, uh, now TransPerfect's handling these projects from collection all the way through to production. And we've been identifying people uh, with special techniques or, or specific specialties in the marketplace. You know, some people may may understand Mac better than, than PCs. Other people are, are more inclined to uh, understand web-based uh, technologies. Um, and so we have different specialties in our group. And, and we put, put those people in key locations around, around the world. Um, we, we do have three divisions, uh, distinct divisions, for handling discovery at TransPerfect. We have the Forensic Technology Division, which is usually the front end of that process. Uh, and then we have a processing group, which, which traditionally handles the ingestion and then uh, loading of the data into the review environment. And then we have a hosting team. Uh, but to, to avoid bottlenecks, we have PM teams that are assigned and involved in the case early on. Um, and We've also established handoffs between these divisions, which is an automated process, and it's a repeatable process. Uh, we have tracking mechanisms so that uh, if there's any question as to what's been done throughout the case, we can go back into that tracking application and say, this is, you know, this is what was, was completed. Uh, as far as dis defensibility is concerned, uh, we've been you know, since since my coming in, anyways, uh, we've implemented a, um, a chain of custody tracking, evidence database, and storage um, system uh, for basically tracking everything from from the beginning to the end of of a process. Uh, we have automated um, extraction and reporting capabilities uh, from computer forensic images. Uh, and taking the the result of exporting out of those images into the um, into the processing platform, and obviously we're using detailed chain of custody along the way. Uh, ESI, our ESI department, as well as our hosting departments, are using uh, consistent, proven workflows that that have been established long before we even uh, forensic technology came into you know came into view here. Um, with regards to time management, I mean, we're, we're getting 20 to 50 new cases on a monthly basis. Um, we're consistently looking for new talented people uh, to join our management teams, training them up, um, putting people in locations that have a heavy volume of, of case work. And, you know, we're using the same process consistently around the globe, whether we're doing it in Beijing, China, or in San Francisco or New York, we're all using the same process. And anyone from any location, if they're not busy at a given time, can jump in and work on a project. Right. Wow. So, you know, so clearly, I mean, I think, Babs, you were speaking earlier about technology and how you adapt that into the workflow. And I think the interesting takeaway I do from Mike's talk here is really that, you know, TransPerfect has really evolved and added technology. and. and and made sure that, that they embraced the workflow so that uh, defensibility challenges were met. So, so Babs, if we come back to you and, and talk about the, um, you know, a lot of litigation support organizations, whether they be in the service business, whether they be in their own in-house uh, organization, uh, a lot of them that we talk to have, have been sticking with existing workflows, workflows that they've um, utilized for, for years and years and years and use, using the same technology, which has really become outdated. So as we were talking earlier, legal tech is right around the corner, believe it or not. You know, we're going to see a lot of technology and a lot of um, enhancements. Um, how do you evaluate and revise these processes? You know, how do you look at technology? And you mentioned workflow and, and being able to have a, 
a unified workflow is pretty key so that data is, is, is much more defensible. Um, you know, I know EDJ Group is, is in, this, in this business and works with a lot of clients. What kind of conversations do you have with customers around this and, and how do you help them advise them on technology here? Well, I think, unfortunately, this uh, is kind of a constant thing that people should be looking at. And I know folks in-house are probably, you know, groaning, saying, I, you know, I'm running cases. You know, maybe I'm going to trial. I don't have time to be constantly evaluating technology. But unfortunately, I think, I think people do. Um, I think uh, from a pricing standpoint, uh, people should be looking at their, you know, their their uh, relationship with their service providers related to pricing. I think they should look at that once a year. Um, related to their own technology, you know, what happens is it's like the devil you know is better than you the devil you don't. So people will stay with technology that they don't love. Um, because they just don't want, because they have like such tribal knowledge of the the failures and the benefits of that technology. So I really understand that. Um, but people do. I think people should be looking, you know, constantly for new technology. They should be looking for ways to enhance the technology that they have. I think they should be working with folks outside. Um, service providers that they use who are sometimes in a position to have stuff that's more current, sometimes not. Um, it really depends. Um, I think that anybody needs to look very seriously at how much care, manual care and feeding all this stuff takes. Um, and you know, I talk to service providers all the time, and some of them have still have very manual um, workflow processes, and I think that that's something that needs to be looked at very seriously. Um, legal tech is great. Um, you know, I talk to law firm folks, and they don't necessarily get a lot of support when it comes to making use of their networking and interacting with the community, et cetera, to look at this stuff. I think that smart firms, if they have an in-house organization, or even if they're outsourcing everything, smart firms should know that they should empower their e-discovery and discovery professionals to keep tabs on um, what is out there, uh, you know, what, what improvements are in the industry, because, because I think that that directly goes back to how they can, they can help their clients. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, as, as a partner of TransPerfect, you know, TransPerfect uses our technology. So I think, you know, we know that they're constantly looking for the latest, greatest stuff that, it, that can adapt into their workflow and methodology. So, I mean, uh, Mike, you mentioned there's a lot of um, enhancements and upgrades that you, you've made to the organization over the, over the years. Um, you know, I know there's a number of projects that have been very challenging over, you know, in 2013 and even earlier. Can you talk about examples of some of those and why you had to, how you had to, you know, revise or audit your technology infrastructure um, to maintain currency to be able to solve these challenges? Yeah, sure. And, and to, to add to that as well, we do, you know, I know that we're currently working with, with index engines to uh, maybe add some additional functionality to the product. And we do that with a lot of our uh, technology um, components that we add into the mix here at, at TransPerfect. You know, as far as, as maintaining currency is concerned, we're, we're constantly training and researching new technologies out there. Um, I don't think a week goes by uh, without us getting some off-the-wall request for something that we've never seen before, um, and we'll take a look into it and, and you know, provide our feedback. I think I'll even discuss in a couple of slides how we, how we go about doing that. Um, but it is all about training and research and identifying, you know, assessing, identifying, and acquiring technology, you know, technology like index engines. Last year we went out and we purchased Digital Reef, uh, which has been a big component of, of what we do here at TransPerfect. As, as far as some, some examples are concerned, you know, we, you know, I have a couple of them. I could probably go on all day talk, giving examples. but. Um, one of them, we had a client 
down in South Florida that was uh, that had to search and produce terabytes of data, um, and it had to be done in a very short time frame. Uh, and this particular group was trying to do it on their own. I mean, this is a corporate client. Uh, they have a savvy IT department, and they're using a freeware linear search tool to run their searches. Um, obviously, they could not comply with <laughs> with that tool and uh, and meeting the court's demands. Um, so they did, and I can't remember if it was a law firm that reached out or if it was the corporation that reached out. Um, but they needed help, and we came in, we took a look at what they had, and uh, eventually ended up implementing an index engines environment, which is still in use today there. You know, we got through the large terabytes of data quickly, we were able to run the searches, we were able to extract and put it into uh, the review environment, um, and, and ultimately get the documents produced, um, and, you know, they're continuing to use it for you know, for other engagements as well. Um, we had a second client, which uh, the only thing they had to go to was backup tape. Um, the, they needed to, to produce documents uh, relevant to the matter. Those documents didn't exist anywhere other than backup tape, and we're talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds of backup tapes, um, mostly of, of email data. Um, you know, the the initial, I guess, request from the court was, hey, you know, just restore all the backup tapes and produce all the mailboxes. Um, obviously, you know, our our client um, law firm did not want to go through with that, so we came up with a uh, process and procedure for using index engines to uh, index those tapes and come up with a workflow that met the court's demands um, in that timeline. Um, and really gave us a, a more defensible process as far as being able to go back. Everything's in one location. It's all indexed. Uh, so if anything is questioned, we can always go back into that index and find exactly what's needed. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the challenge I think we see pretty often is a lot of folks come to us, you know, since we're a technology vendor, at, at the 11th hour and they're kind of stuck. I mean, I know how much of your time, Mike, do you spend looking out and seeing what's out there and kind of anticipating some of these challenges? Because the, the painful, you know, the pain, painful projects are one where you have to go in and fix something or go in there and, and, and uh, try to apply technology where you've got deadlines, you know, that by Monday morning you've got to perform miracles over the weekend. So does understanding exactly what's going on in the market um, help you in these situations or is it, is it a constant challenge? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it can be challenging. I mean, it, it's really all about having a plan. Um, we do a lot of mobile type uh, engagements. Uh, we recently did something in in Beijing, China, which was a last minute, you know, mobilization, create a war room type setting. I mean, we're we're always prepared to meet to meet any type of challenge that'll come up. So. You know, we are we are looking at new technology. We're coming up with workflows, what if scenarios, you know, what if we're you know, we have to we have to do this, what are we going to do? Um so that is a, a part of our strategy. So Babs, um let me come back to you and I, I know we were discussing a bit about technology and, and also we started out a bit with workflow and defensibility. So I, I I, you know, I'm a true believer that I think that that workflow, you know, having a sound and a valid and a and a very solid workflow is the key to defensibility. You know, so what are the challenges that organizations have around workflow, and how can they uh, plug technology um, into their workflow um, most effectively? Well, I mean, obviously, from what I've said, um, there's just too much manual interaction between the steps, whether it's between you know, maybe there's an actual collection consultant um, into processing, et cetera, et cetera. There's just too much human interaction there. So I think that, first of all, work actual workflow applications that interact with, um, you know, any other applications that are actually analyzing, processing the data. You know, first of all, I mean, I think one of the nice, again, I, I, I feeling very positive about technology in our industry because I feel like the um, 
analytics that, that people have been working on for years are, are getting really downstream, which means that we can look at the data earlier in the process and we can look at it in an intelligent way. So I'm really excited about that. You know, I love people being able to look at email archives, for example, without just collecting everything belonging to Jim Smith. I think, I think that that's marvelous. Um, and I think it's just going to get more uh, kind of empowered in that kind of area. One of the things I just want to say, really nuts and bolts about workflow, and I have been really on every side of this. I have worked in four service providers and had to interact with this stuff. I've been the client, et cetera, et cetera. What really irks me is reporting. So if I think of like my dream workflow applications, I think of reports that are fairly easy to create. And this is assuming there isn't just that, you know, that the client can't necessarily get right on, say, a website or whatever. You know, uh, any time there is a bottleneck in creating a report, either within the organization or to go outside the organization to a client, I am not happy. And we have all had these, these kinds of experiences where you reach out to the project manager or whatever and you say, hey, can I have the latest report on the custodians that were collected so far from the client site? And they say, yeah, I'll get that for you later today. Well, if that, now maybe they're just really busy, right? But if that's the case, it says to me that there is less, that there is too much manual interaction with, with the whole workflow, um, assuming that the report isn't something really, really custom. So that for me is a trigger. And I just feel that that is one of the things that reporting uh, in workflow is also one of the direct, it has a direct um, you know, bearing on defensibility. If it's hard to produce a helpful report, then that is going to be, that to me is a massive bottleneck. Um, and I hope people understand, you know, what, what I'm talking about when I talk about these reports. You know, if, if, if it takes a long time to get information from collection to the point where you're processing that, you know, these are just red, uh, red flags for me. And I think with workflow applications that I'm seeing being creative, created, and I'm seeing more and more reporting within, um, uh, e-discovery applications, I think that this is going to ease. And again, the more um, information people can, can create in an, a client-facing application, that's great. Pretty soon people are just going to look at their iPads and say, oh, look, my data is 80% through, you know, whatever phase. And that's really where we're headed. So, so let me expand a little bit on that, Bad. So in terms of you know, does an organization kind of map out their workflow and then go and find technology that fits into it? Or do they go and they, they find technology and build workflow around that? Or is it a combination of the both? What's the thought process around that? Oh, wow. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think what happens is they people own uh, pieces of technology and they update some of them, not all. And then, and then the workflow has to change. Um, and, you know, we see this over and over again. You know, even, even when people go to new applications, maybe even suites of applications that all kind of fit together like Lego, you know, people often have legacy systems. So I think it's really hard for people to do what's sometimes consultants call a true technology refresh. It's interesting, I have been chatting with some law firms who have made some leaps into uh, aggressive outsourcing. And um, I'm not necessarily an advocate of it, I'm just saying I'm talking to these folks. And, and there are times when they've been able to do this because there's been a reason why they, they're able to let go of their current technology. So it's hard to come to that fork in the road. I think people are often real. I have myself been in organizations where I have said to the powers that be, we need to replace this, we need to move on. And they're like, well, you know, we've had it for 20 years. I like it. <laughs> so we all yeah. know this is hard. Yeah, no, it's very hard, and you know, you have people that are trained to use it. It's a process that you've used for years. I mean, I think that's the big challenge. I know, um, Mike. I, I know this question that I had prepared here. I think we kind of addressed it, but 
Well, but when you guys have, I mean, how frequently, I mean, how difficult does it change your workflow and your processes at TransPerfect? And, and is, is it really driven by the customer, or, or is TransPerfect really kind of mapping out better, newer, improved processes which they sell to customers? So, for example, when they come to you and say, hey, we want all these backup tapes restored so we can dump them into our indexing and search tool, you can come and say, hey, no, there's a better way and there's a better workflow that makes more sense. Is it, is it uh, are customers willing to hear those conversations? And um, is that a challenge or are they, they kind of lean on you to be able to come in and say, uh, you know, we're the experts here? Yeah, I mean, there, there are some clients that are more receptive to, uh, you know, new technology and a new way of doing things that may be more, um, more efficient. Um, you know, like a new workflow or a new technology. I mean, even even though Index Engines has been out there for, I, I think I've been using you guys for probably eight years now, um, you know, I still find that, you know, a lot of people in the marketplace just want you to restore entire tape sets. And, um, you know, so certainly that's... <laughs> that can be done, but is it the most cost effective? Uh, I don't know, and you have to take a look at, um, you know, what the scope of the actual case is. I mean, if you're dealing with thousands of backup tapes, then probably not, because you're going to pay a ton on the uh, on the processing component of the project. However, you know, if, if you're using something like index engines and only, you know, sele selecting or doing selective restorations, um, it's less wear and tear on the tape. Um, and uh, you're only uh, restoring stuff that's responsive to that particular matter. And, and it also gives the end client an opportunity at the end of that engagement to, you know, pursue some type of tape remediation um, project as well. Um, and, and I also did want to comment a little bit about the reporting um, that Babs was talking about. And, you know, that's one of the things that, I see as being a huge bottleneck in, in this entire process. And it's also something, you know, when BAP says, hey, you know, I want to report on who was collected and, and what that collection entailed and, you know, where are we at through the process of, you know, maybe extracting from those collections and providing to processing, when am I going to be able to review my documents? You know, that's a huge component. And, you know, to come up with the proper workflow and, and even a defensible process, like we won't update to a new version of software until we have the reporting feature, you know, in there. So, like our standard process, when we, uh, when, and I'll talk a little bit later about what we do, you know, some of the bottlenecks, uh, best practices and bottlenecks, um, which I think is a couple slides away. Um, when, when we get a pro, when we get a project, we will we will provide the report to the client say, Here, here's what you have. We need you to sign off on this before this can move forward. Um, here's what was collected. Here's the stuff that meets the filter criteria. Uh, here's your timeline for, you know, getting to, getting to the, uh, the actual review. Yeah, so I think, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of getting close to the end of the session. We're going to start talking a little, little bit about best practices. Uh, if anybody on the call does have questions for the speakers here, please put them in, type them in the question um, window there, and we'll, we'll take them um, as time permits. But I think let's, let's go back to you, Babs, and talk a little bit, bit about what you think are best practices. I think it's, you know, the end of 2013, we're in, entering into 2014. If you were starting up a litigation support team, you know, what would you think about as best practices in eliminating some of these bottlenecks we've been talking about in not only the collection, but through management and review of ESI? Well, I think Mike really set it up. Um, the f you want to develop your as many of your protocols ahead of time, early in the process as possible. So, and unfortunately, it falls to the more mature member of the team to do this. So if the law firm is really great at this, they need to say, at the out, outset of the either the relationship, the process, or whatever, or even during the RFI process, which I have I have said, they need to say these are our formats. Uh, in this matter, you will be interacting with, and you know, 
lay out who the, I recommend a, um, a SPOC, a single point of contact, and you know they should find out um, what report formats are available. They should specify any custom reports that they want, and then there should be uh, an expectation of when those reports will be, and it sounds really Stone Age to be talking about reports back and forth, but let's face it, that's you know uh, what we're talking about. There should be an expectation of when that report will be report or reports will be sent every day. You know, maybe you say to the to the um, collection folks, I want to see an updated report every day at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time to my um, my SPOC. And that should go on the other side too, whoever you're dealing with. Even if you're doing this in-house and you have a case team and you have in-house e-discovery, you need to know who on that e-discovery team is your point of contact. Is it, you know, if it's a vendor, is it your project manager? Are you getting everything from that person? That kind of thing should absolutely be in place. And then everything should really flow from that. Again, you know, we could go on and on about about best practices related to, say, processing. Like, I'm always concerned if a lot of if data moves from application to application, or even from facility to facility, or server to server. Um, uh, one of the things related to a bottleneck and and management of ESI that doesn't get reported, I think, in a proactive way is exception reporting. You should not have, the client should not have to call the vendor or the project manager at the vendor should not have to call down to processing and say, well, I want to see the files that didn't make it, right? Or I, or I, nobody should have to tell anybody that, um, that OCR, that, that files with not non-searchable text should be OCR. That kind of thing should just be there from the get-go. Um, and, um, you know, it should be just kind of self-evident. And, and watching that stuff should be um, self-evident in the process. Um, related to the management of ESI, related, re related to defensibility, you know, predictive coding is the flavor of the month, and so culling is getting a bad rap. But I think culling, analytics culling, um, sophisticated search term culling is still very much part of most people's processes. And I'm seeing more and more of that in a sophisticated way and done by vendors in a really where they have very expert staff who will help that process along, um, which I think is great. Um, and I think um, you want to see, if you're on the client side, you want to see um, the defensibility related to any culling that goes on. Like if search terms are applied, how are they applied, who does it, what software gets used, you know, that kind of thing. And I just think that best practices for these things are all about preparation. We talk, talk about repeatable processes, it's only repeatable if you have a process. And you only have a process if you have, in fact, thought about it. So whether it's a law firm or a service provider or a corporation, you need to take time out, even though you're putting out fires, and figure out what, um, figure out the process and try, even though you're going to have to change it, of course, because there's always something new that comes down the pike. But not to go on and on and on, but I, I mean, I think that that's what it is. Best practices are things that have been embraced because people have given thought to them. Um, so that I think that's what I would say about that. Yeah, so, um, Mike, maybe you could add some, some of your feedback on best practices used in your organization to overcome e-discovery bottlenecks. Sure, sure. You know, I I have four, you know, main bottlenecks that, you know, I think we we encounter and and one of you know, the number one is moving data from the collection to the processing environment. Uh, number two would be the ingestion of data. Um, number three would be getting the data from from the processing platform into the hosting platform, and then number four would be productions. Um, you know, moving moving data from a collection to, to processing, it's time consuming, especially if you're dealing with um, 
uh, with full forensic images. Um, there's so what we do to alleviate that bottleneck is we'll pre-flight the data as soon as we um, we perform the collection. We'll bring the data back to our lab and we'll get those initial you know processes running on it, which is basically you know recovering folders if the client wants uh, to recover deleted items. We'll um, denist. Uh, and then we'll use a file filter, uh, which is an inclusion filter, uh, which the clients obviously um, already agreed to as well. Uh, so that, and then we'll provide the report. So once the client says go, we can we can export that data directly to our processing environment, uh, and then we make you know long pat, long file paths can be an issue as well when dealing with forensic images. So we make sure that uh, we alleviate any of those types of bottlenecks. Um, when it comes to ingestion of data, you know, large data sets can take take a long time. We're traditionally a law processing shop. Uh, if we deal with something with a case that's too large for law, uh, if the time constraints, you know, law we can't use law to do it, uh, we'll use some other type of proprietary technology, like we'll use index engines or we'll use digital read. Um, when we are doing using the law environment, we'll segregate, you know, the the processing data loads so that we can get through them quicker, um, uh, and we have a distributed uh, environment for dealing with those. When it comes to getting data from the processing environment to the hosting environment, we have a direct link into the relativity environment with a with a very fast pipe. Uh, we'll do rolling data loads to make sure that there's enough documents for review uh, while you know other processes are going on. And when it comes to productions, um, we're really doing daily checks and looking for docs that meet the production criteria, and we're preparing images in advance so that when it comes time to produce, that information is already ready, and um, we can you know move forward with the production. Okay. Thanks very much, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, we're running short on time. One of the things I want to do, um, just do a brief little uh, commercial on index engines. One of the, the, the topics we had talked about today was really a uh, unified workflow to be able to go from initial identification down to review um, using some of the powerful tools. And, and I think if you do have a chance to talk to index engines, you should talk to us about our unified approach that is not only unified, but auditable, defensible, and cost-effective from initial identification, whether it be online sources like networks and desktops to offline sources like forensic images or backup tapes to be able to do field collections or on-site collections, process, hold, and, and preserve the data, um, and then connect it to relativity or other review platforms. So I think that's one of the important points we talked about today. Um, as an offer, we have a number of papers available. If you want to send an uh, email to myself, my email address is down there. We have a TransPerfect case study. We also have a paper that talks about the 10 steps to streamlining your e-discovery lab, and that's available for you. Um, as far as the speakers today, um, their email addresses are on the screen here. Um, I know we're very short on time, so I don't think we'll have time for any specific questions. Uh, but you can reach out to them directly. They're always available uh, to help you out and to provide advice. Uh, but I want to thank Babs today for your time. Always great to speak to you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you before Legal Tech. Uh, Mike, uh, um, thank you again uh, for your support and, and for your wisdom here as well. And again, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to them directly or shoot me an email, and we'll happy to send you a link to the presentation or any of the papers that we mentioned. Okay, thank you all for your time. Appreciate it, and we'll be speaking with you soon. Great, thank you. Thank you.